and welcome to Spanish Answers, a podcast that gives you unas yavitas claves as you unlock your Spanish language adventure. I'm your host, Sarah, with Language Answers, and today in episode 85, we will complete our series on homesteading. So, welcome to part two of our homesteading vocabulary. Today, we'll go over some vocabulary that you might never have heard of unless you've been reading children's books or farming blogs in Spanish mainly words dealing with livestock. Not to mention our second part of our cultural tip on the Dominican Republic, important national holidays. So, let's begin. First off, a quick update. My sincere apologies. I didn't realize that my podcast for episode 84 hadn't actually uploaded because I, in a moment of stupidity or rather exhaustion, did not remember to upload the audio file after I'd finished uploading and editing everything else. So if you got to notice that the podcast was up, but all you could access was the blog, I am so sorry. That has been fixed as of Monday this week, so June 19th, and I hope never to repeat that mistake. Uh, I'm sure instead I'll make more new ones. <laughs> but I appreciate your patience, and again, I'm so sorry. On the positive side, you'll get two episodes this week, which never happens, so yay! Anyways, I am sorry about that, guys. Now, let's start on our homesteading vocabulary for the springtime, part two. If you missed last week's episode, I recommend you first check it out before listening to today's podcast or reading today's blog post. In episode 84, I explained what homesteading is and we delved into some good gardening vocab. If you really enjoyed that episode and would like more recommendations, I also recommend the YouTube channels Growfully with Jenna and Melissa K. Norris. Also, more appropriate for today's episode, we love the YouTube channel Okabode, which mainly revolves around chickens. Now, as I mentioned in the last episode, I don't have time to do an exhaustive list of the different homesteading terms and uses. That's why we covered gardening last time, and today we'll talk about raising livestock, but with the main focus being on chickens. Please note, I won't provide translations for basic animal words or groupings, as those were covered in episodes 59, 60, and 61. Now, rather than just giving you a huge list while talking about raising livestock, I'm going to try doing it in that paragraph slash story format again. So if you're listening to the podcast, see if you can better understand the vocabulary when I read through it a second time, minus the English translations. And if you're reading the blog, try reading through it a second time without looking at the translations. So dealing with chickens. When we decided to start our own parvada de pollos, flock of chickens, we first bought los pollitos from un criadero, a hatchery, who shipped us 15 pollitos, dos machos y 13 hembras. At least, we hope so. It is very hard, even for los expertos, to properly identify a chicken's gender. When we picked them up from the post office, we immediately put them in their caja de criadora, brooding box. No es un incubadora, incubator, as we did not want to be responsible for them naciendo o saliendo del cascarón, basically hatching. We set them up with electrolyte water, special food, and una placa calefactora para pollitos, chick brooder heating plate. No nos gustan las lámparas de calor, heating lamps, because of the fire risk. But we did place una bombilla roja, as it is important to cover any injuries the chicks might get from each other to prevent further picoteando, or pecking. Weakness in the animal kingdom is a dangerous thing. Eventually, as los pollitos grew, we moved them into their gallinero, or chicken coop. We are currently constructing their corral, chicken run, but they have more than enough space and ventilación while they wait. We're going to need unos ponederos, nesting boxes, so that the gallinas can poner unos huevos, lay eggs. Already, our young gallos can kind of cacarear, crow, saying kikiriki, or cockadoodle-doo. We love it. The hens cacarean, or cluck, saying cock, 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 or cara, cara, which is different from when they all were pollitos. Then they said pew, pew, cheep, cheep. So before we go ahead and repeat that, but without the translations, I want to point out a few things. One is, for more animal sounds in Spanish, you can check out the article I've included in the show notes by FluentU or by ThoughtCo. Because yes, they do have different sounds in Spanish. Anyways, there's a classic Spanish folk song that I love to sing to my little girl called De Colores. And in it, the song covers all three animals and their sounds. I've included a YouTube video link, and this video has lyrics and translations if you want to hear it. Anyways, 
I found a really interesting site that seems mostly dedicated to raising chickens, and it is completely in Spanish. So you can check it out at pollo.info. I don't know much about it, as I just discovered it, but the little I have read seems legit. Either way, if you want to develop your poultry vocabulary, this is definitely a good place to start. For instance, I learned that a possum is called una zariguella. Una zariguella. That's way better than possum. Also, I have had the hardest time figuring out which word to use for flock. From what I've read, in general, people refer to a flock of hens as las gallinas, but there are actual terms out there. I've found also bandada de pollos and manada de pollos. You can even use gallineria to refer to a group of just hens. But parvada seems to be the best choice for a flock of chickens. So let me know if you've heard otherwise. Let's go ahead and read that again. When we decided to start our own parvada de pollos, we first bought los pollitos from un criadero who shipped us 15 pollitos, dos machos y 13 hembras. At least, we hope so. It is very hard, even for los expertos, to properly identify a chicken's gender. When we picked them up from the post office, we immediately put them in their caja de criadora, no as un incubadora, as we did not want to be responsible for them naciendo o saliendo del cascarón. We set them up with electrolyte water, special food, and una placa calefactora para pollitos. No nos gustan las lámparas de calor because of the fire risk. But we did place una bombilla roja as it is important to cover any injuries the chicks might get from each other to prevent further picoteando. Weakness in the animal kingdom is a dangerous thing. Eventually, as los pollitos grew, we moved them into their gallinero. We are currently constructing their corral, but they have more than enough space and ventilación while they wait. We're going to need unos ponederos so that the gallinas can poner unos huevos. Already, our young gallos can kind of cacarear, saying kikiriki. We love it. The hens cacarean, saying cock, 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 or cara, cara, which is different from when they all were pollitos. Then they said pew, pew. Other livestock. If you want to raise other ganado livestock, such as vacas, cabras, cerdos, or conejos, I won't be able to tell you much. Just like with chickens, you can raise vacas for carne, meat, or for their productos. With aves de corral, poultry, or aves domésticas, it is los huevos. With cows, it is la leche, milk, that you can also turn into queso, cheese. If you want una vaca mainly for la leche, then you'll want una vaca lechera. Some people like la leche de cabra, goat milk, and I've even seen some places sell jabón, soap, made out of it. You'll want to think about el pienso, feed, that your animals will need, such as la pastura, pasture, or el heno, hay. Do you want to raise your animals organicamente, or do you plan on using las pesticidas on your césped, grass, or buying pienso that might have them? For your cerdos, you'll need un chiquero o una posilga, pig pen or pigsty, to house them. Some people use los establos, barns, to house their animals in. Others create specific areas and buildings for each one. All right, so let's try that again, this time without the translations. See if you can understand it better. If you want to raise other ganado, such as vacas, cabras, cerdos, o conejos, I won't be able to tell you much. Just like with chickens, you can raise vacas for carne or for their productos. With aves de corral or aves domésticas, it is los huevos. With cows, it is la leche that you can also turn into queso. If you want una vaca mainly for la leche, then you'll want una vaca lechera. Some people like la leche de cabra, and I've even seen some places sell jabón made out of it. You'll want to think about el pienso that your animals will need, such as la pastura or el heno. Do you want to raise your animals organicamente, or do you plan on using las pesticidas on your césped, or buying pienso that might have them? For your cerdos, you'll need un chiquero o una posilga to house them. Some people use los establos to house their animals in. Others create specific areas and buildings for each one. And there you have it. Are there any other livestock or homesteading terms you can think of? If so, please send me a note. And if you have also started on this homesteading journey, I wish you all the best. Please let me know what you're doing and how it's going. And now on to our cultural tip. Today, 
today's cultural tip highlights the national holidays of the tropical half island, the Dominican Republic. To save on time, as always, and to avoid extreme repetitiveness, here is a quick list of holidays that many other countries also celebrate and or which we have covered in previous episodes, so I won't get into too much detail for these ones. There's New Year's Day, which is always January 1st, although this year they will have the second off since the first is a Sunday. On January 6th, they always celebrate Epiphany, or Dia de los Santos Reyes, but they will get January 9th off since it is celebrated the Monday after the 6th. Good Friday is April 7th, or Viernes Santo, and it is always the Friday before Easter, which this year, Easter Sunday, will be April 9th. Labor Day is always September 1st, or El... Dia del Trabajo, and it's also known as International Workers' Day. There's Mother's Day, which is May 28th, and it is the last Sunday in May. Technically, it's not an official holiday. Same with Father's Day, which is June 19th, which and it is every third Sunday in June. Again, not an official national holiday. Then you have Corpus Christi, which is June 8th, and it's always the second Thursday after Whitson. And lastly, there's Christmas Day, which is always December 25th, also called La Navidad. Let's go ahead and talk about the six unique holidays that Dominicans celebrate. The first one is Lady of Alta Gracia, which is always celebrated on January 21st and is called Nuestra Señora de la Alta Gracia. There are a few different origin stories for this holiday, but they all revolve around the 16th century painting of Our Lady of High Grace, as the Virgin Mary is the country's patron saint as of 1844. This painting currently resides in the Basilica of Our Lady of Alta Gracia. If you want to see a picture of the painting, which has been available for public viewing since 1571, you can check out the article. Of course, I will include all links in the show notes, but there's an article from Dominican Today that has a picture of it. And if you want to learn more about the church it is in, which it was moved to in 1970, I recommend checking out the Basilica's website. You can also do a virtual tour, and it is super cool. This amazing looking building was made into a minor basilica by Pope Paul VI in 1970. Really recommend you check it out. It is just, it looks really cool. Anyways. One legend claims that a merchant from Savaleon de Igüe was struggling to find a portrait of the Virgin Mary for his daughter, when an old man at an inn gave him one. Miraculously, the painting would disappear from the girl's room every night and appear under a nearby orange tree. This place then became the sacred site of a church. Another story claims that the Virgin Mary appeared to a peasant from Extremadura while he was walking through the woods. She was level with the tree branches, hence Alta Gracia. A less miraculous claim states that two brothers brought the painting in 1502 from Spain, or a group of Spaniards, during one of Christopher Columbus's last trips, brought it to the Igwe region. While this holiday used to be celebrated in August during the Assumption of Mary, it was later moved to January 21st to celebrate the Battle of the Sabana Real. For this battle in 1691, the Spanish army defeated the French army on the island with help from the Virgen de la Alta Gracia. The second holiday is Juan Pablo Duarte Day, and it is always celebrated January 26th, called Natalicio de Juan Pablo Duarte, but the holiday will be celebrated on January 30th this year. Anyways, this holiday celebrates one of the founders of the Dominican Republic, Juan Pablo Duarte. He was born on January 26, 1813. For some historical context, the island gained its independence from Spain in 1821, but then fell to the Haitians. Duarte and others created La Trinitaria in July 1838, which was a secret society that played a key role in undermining the Haitians. He actually had the opportunity to become president after the Dominican Republic gained their independence in 1844, but rejected it and was then later exiled by the man who did become president, Pedro Santana. To celebrate, there is a special mass of the church where Duarte was baptized, the Santa Barbara Church. Number three, Independence Day. This is always celebrated on February 27th, Dia de la Independencia Nacional. This holiday celebrates the Dominican Republic's independence from Haiti in 1844. Let's remember that the entire island, with the arrival of Christopher Columbus in December 1492, became the first permanent European settlement in the newly discovered world. It gained its independence from Spain in 1821. But then it was unified by Haiti through military force. Then Duarte, Matias Ramón Mela, and Francisco de Rosario Sánchez created La Trinitaria, which revolted and declared independence from Haiti on February 27, 1844. To celebrate, Independence Day marks the grand finale of a month-long celebration, filled with carnivals across the eastern half of the island. While each region has its own unique way of celebrating, one common feature is the limping devil, or the Diablo Cojuelo, with popping balloons and a devil's whip. There is also the National Military Parade, headed by the president and his wife. For an interesting glimpse into the costumes of Carnival, you can check out the video by Go Dominican Republic. Number four is Restoration Day, and it is always celebrated on August 16th, and it's called El Dia de la Restauración Dominicana. 
This holiday celebrates the beginning of the Dominican Restoration War, which started on August 16, 1863 with the Grito de Capotillo, when 15 men raided Dajabon City and raised the Dominican flag on Capotillo Hill. Remember that first president after the Haitian rule, Pedro Santana? Well, he basically made a deal with Spain in 1861 to make the Dominican Republic subject once again to Spain. This did not go over well with the islanders, who rebelled. Santana resigned in 1862, and the war for independence from Spain, again, lasted until Queen Isabel II of Spain repealed the island's reinstatement under Spanish rule on March 3, 1865. Nowadays, presidents are sworn in every four-year election cycle on this day. If it's not an election year, they do a speech similar to our State of the Union address. Number five, Our Lady of Mercedes, also known as La Fiesta de las Mercedes, and it's always held on September 24th. This is the feast day of the Virgin Mary for the Mercedian Order. According to legend, Mary appeared to St. Peter Nolasco and King James of Aragon in 1218, asking them to create the Mercedarian Order, whose purpose was to free Christians taken captive by the Moors. The feast day was created in 1615. In the Dominican Republic, the Virgin Mary appeared, startling the natives in 1495 and giving victory in battle to the Spanish. With more visitations from the Lady of Mercedes, they built a church at the site. And last, but certainly not least, we have Constitution Day, or Dia de la Constitución, which is always November 6th, although it is observed on the Monday or Friday closest to the 6th, hence it is observed on November 5th this year. In a country with as much upheaval as the Dominican Republic has had, I can understand having a national holiday for one's constitution. The U.S. does, by the way, have a Constitution Day. It's celebrated on September 17th and is officially called Constitution Day and Citizenship Day, but it's not actually a federal holiday. You can learn more about it at the National Archives website. And of course, check out that link in the show notes. Now, after Santo Domingo, or modern-day Dominican Republic, gained its independence from Haiti, it created its first constitution in Santo Domingo on November 6th, 1844. They based it on the U.S. Constitution, although it has been amended many times, each time counting as a new constitution. It currently is the country's 39th constitution. Wow. And that's all for today. Thank you so much for listening, and don't forget to check out the show notes for links to the resources used for this episode. If you'd prefer to read an approximate transcription of today's episode, you can also visit the episode's blog. I would love to help you on your Spanish journey. So if you have any questions about today's episode, or even just on Spanish culture or grammar, you can reach me at contact at languageanswers.com or visit my website for more information. I can also be contacted regarding my services for Spanish to English translation, English technical writing, editing, and content creation or even language consultations and tutoring for you or your business. Remember, learning a language is a lifelong journey. So please, aprovechalo, disfrútalo y compártelo. I'll see you in two weeks. We're going to talk about the differences between the verbs saber and conocer. ¡Hasta luego!